Ladies and gentlemen, panelists, let's begin with the second part, with the second session today. Let's take our seats and let's get started. I invite everybody to join us in the main room and to, of course, take your positions, get ready for the next chapter in today's discussion. I welcome you to the second part of our event today. This is the second ministerial roundtable. This time the theme is on the digital economy. Uh, this topic, of course, connects intimately with our previous discussion. And of course, we have a number of speakers uh, that could not address us before, but will do so in this event. Of course, I encourage everybody to let us know uh, they want to speak. Uh, after our keynote speakers now uh, by raising their placard, drawing my attention or drawing the attention of the staff around us. Thank you very much. Gotcha. Um, right now, it's uh, my turn to introduce to you His Excellency Mr. Boris Koprivnikar. Um, he will address us as our first keynote speaker today, sir. Thank you, thank you, uh, Secretary General, Commissioner Ansip, Excellencies, Delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I'm privileged to speak to you about the topics that uh, I'm really keen about it and we work hard in Slovenia because we believe that the digitalizations and all the opportunities that brings can really help to improve the quality of life of citizens and the business opportunities. I've been asked which are technologies uh, which has the best potential for the future. Is it uh, 5G, big data, IoT, maybe blockchain, mo different mobility concept? These are all technologies that have to interlink between themselves. And I strongly believe that the best result or the most impact we will have in the future in the field of cognitiveness because all those technologies can predict and learn what we need and they can support our life, our work, and our decision-making. Today's challenges that we have, cybersecurity, free flow of data, data protection, big data, synchronizations, can become the opportunities of tomorrow. And I think that the biggest opportunity that we have with the digitalization is on very political level. It's the opportunity in the field of trust. Because trust in government is necessary if we want to have a support. And if we want to gain trust again, we can react based on digital technologies more re reliable. We can respond faster. We can act more open. We can open data. We can open procedures because it's very simple to share it with the digital resources that we have. We can act more with competencies. We can work better, we can do better decision making. We can use big data that can support us that our decision making is really evidence based because the data is something that can really help us that we decide more wisely. And we can act also with better integrity with better transparency, which will gain trust of citizens and also businesses. Digital economy of the future is the economy of the future, because there is practically no economy which is not digitally or at least totally dependent on digital processes. There is no economic process that is not digital. But we have to understand that there are two main opportunities. One is that we can improve the internal processes of our 
producers, processes, companies, that we, with the digital technology, are more effective, more efficient. We do better what we do, and maybe we find new products that did not exist before. The second very important opportunity in the digital economy field is global market, which is now accessible basically to everyone. If we use the communication tools, we can buy, sell, and compose our businesses globally. Today, it's completely natural what was maybe 10, 15 years ago just a dream. But today, we can do our business immediately globally. And because of that globalization, we are facing also opportunities and challenges of so-called sharing economy. We can share resources, we can share partners, we can share markets. And in that field, I also strongly believe that blockchain technologies will have to be very serious in place because this is the only technology which can globally solve some problems like measuring added value, like uh, taxation, like insurances, because this is the only technology which is not dependent on, on central decision of separate government, but can be spread over internet, over sharing economy, like it's spread everything what is based on uh, internet. And uh, I'm optimist about the future technology. There is always the question, will this uh, ICT have a human face in the future? Of course it will, because any technology that we build, we build. People build technology, and we build it for our purposes. We build it to support our businesses. We build it to make our lives more comfortable. So definitely, it will have a few human face because we will build these technologies for our needs. And if we build trust, if we act more smart using data and database decision making, it's very important, and this is also the topic today mentioned frequently, we have to be synchronized. If we don't synchronize our processes, data will not flow. If we don't synchronize our platforms, we cannot share software solutions. So synchronization is something what is important task of every government, and I strongly believe it's important task of every government to synchronize the processes with other governments. So this is why we need platforms like ITU, which is a wonderful platform for synchronization of our processes that we can share what we build, we can trade, we can travel, we can even protect together by the threats that are, that are common with the digitalization. Slovenia is just a little more than 25 years old country. We decided to be green reference country in digital Europe because we find that single European market is something that's of vital interest also for Slovenia. This is why we are not seeking for new inventions, for new, new things that are not already been th thought about. We are seeking for a system solutions based on new technology. This is new added value. If we can measure the blood pressure and uh, blood picture and, and uh, prevent stroke, it's okay. We all know that this works. But how to put it on the system level? You have to change the law, you have to change the financial models, you have to educate the doctors, you have to promote it to the citizens. This is no technology. Technology is just a product that we have to learn to use it. And this is then a system change, and only then the whole country, citizens and businesses can benefit of what are techno technological uh, possibilities. We say also that we changed our processes, that we digitalized them. No paper, now it's digital. Then we made, made them mobile. We can do whatever we do, wherever we are. Today, here, from Argentina, I can do all the work as it, I would be in the office. But smart and synchronized is something that is really in front of us, that we can do it more uh, efficient. For any international organization, I strongly believe have to be important, have to have influence, have to be a platform, 
platform of a cooperation and have to be useful for the members. And they find the ITU is organization that is aligned in these uh, attributes. And I strongly believe that in next 25 years, it will be even more important organization, better ground for collaboration, and needed solutions from the, our members will be better shared between the members. So I would like to congratulate for the 25 years of the ITU uh, development sector and wish uh, many good years of common work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Boris Korpivrikar, Deputy Vice, Deputy Prime Minister from Slovenia. Uh, it is now my turn to call another speaker. Um, this man is Majed Almazied. Um, he's Deputy Governor, Communications and Information Technology Commission, the CITC from Saudi Arabia, and of course your country is the Platinum Sports sponsors of the ITUD 25th anniversary event. Please. Thank you. Sahab al Ma'ali al Wazara, Ma'ali al Amin al Amin al Tihad al Duali al Tisalat, Sahab al Sa'ada al Sayyidat wa Sada, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إنه لمن دواعي سروري أن أتحدث إليكم في هذه الجلسة المتعلقة بالاقتصاد الرقمي وأود أن أهنئ الاتحاد الدولي للاتصالات وقطاع التنمية على الإنجازات التي تحققت خلال الخمسة وعشرين سنة الماضية ونتطلع إلى المزيد من الإنجازات في الأعوام القادمة خاصة فيما يتعلق بتوصيل الغير موصولين في شتى أنحاء العالم لقد أصبحت الاتصالات وتقنية المعلومات مادة الاقتصاد الجديد والمكون الرئيس لعامة ما نستخدمه اليوم وبات المجتمع بأسره ينتظر منتجات جديدة أكثر سحرا وإبهارا حتى أصبح سوق التقنية والاتصالات السوق الأنشط والأثرى بل والأذكى أيضا فالذكاء لم يعد بشريا فحسب بعد أن رأينا التقنية شريكا للإنسان وتساهم في جعل حياته أكثر سهولا ونجاحا وتنظيما فمن آلة ذكية إلى سيارة ذكية ولا, يزك ولا يزال الذكاء الاصطناعي يتسع مستعينا بقدرات المبرمجين والباحثين من أمثال الشاب الصغير بالعمر والكبير بالإمكانيات والقدرات المتواجد معنا في هذه الجلسة تنماي بكشي لقد أدركت حكومة المملكة العربية السعودية أهمية الاقتصاد الرقمي وجعلته, وجعلته من ركائز استراتيجيتها عشرين ثلاثين وفي ذلك إطار وتنويع لمصادر الدخل وتحقيق الرفاهية والاقتصاد الاجتماعي وتلعب المملكة دورا محوريا ومهما في تنمية الاقتصاد العالمي خاصة الرقمي كونها تعد أحد أعضاء مجموعة العشرين ولقد استحدثت حكومة بلادي وحدة خاصة بالتحول الرقمي تضم عددا من الوزراء منهم وزير الاتصالات وتقنية المعلومات ووزير الصحة ووزير التعليم ووزير المالية ووزير التجارة والاستثمار ووزير الطاقة والصناعة والثروة المعدنية ومن أولويات هذه الوحدة تمكين الاقتصاد الرقمي على المستوى الوطني السيدات والسادة تسعد المملكة العربية السعودية في رعاية أنشطة الاتحاد التي تبرز الفرص والممكنات التي يمكن من خلالها تعزيز القدرات وتحفيز الاستثمارات الرقمية للدول الأعضاء خاصة الدول النامية وتحقيق شراكات ناجحة تعود بالخير على شعوب العالم كافة وتضمن الشمول الرقمي والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mr. Majed Almayzad uh, Thank you very much Deputy Governor Communications and Information Technology Commission from Saudi, Saudi Arabia My next speaker, speaker is probably I'm sure uh, he's the youngest uh, at least speaker in the room. Um, he is a software and artificial intelligence developer uh, with IBM. 
Um, his name is Tanmai Bakshi, um, and Tanmai Bakshi is 13 years old. Definitely the youngest person addressing us today in the room. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon and hello everyone. My name is Tanmay Bakshi. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Toronto, Canada. I'm an algorithmist, AI developer, author, and honorary IBM cloud advisor. Before I begin, I'd like to say a big thank you to ITUD for inviting me to this amazing event, and I'd like to congratulate them on their 25th anniversary. They do a lot of hard work, and their contributions mean a lot to the entire world. Today, I'm here to talk about the next level of the digital economy. In fact, due to the growth and development of the digital economy itself, institutional organizations in fields like education, healthcare, business, security, and cybersecurity are being forced to turn into fully-fledged tech companies. And I believe that the technology they're using is currently undergoing a massive shift to the next level, AI. And I believe that this next level can empower them to do things that they never could have dreamt of before. And that's why today I'm here to talk about the next level of the digital economy itself, which is, I believe, most certainly artificial intelligence. And to show you an example of how AI is already impacting our digital economy, I'd like to take up the example of a project of mine that's very close to my heart, and it's called the cognitive story. It's an example of AI being used in healthcare, and through the cognitive story, we're trying to help a quadriplegic girl named Boo, who suffers from Rett syndrome and lives just nor north of Toronto. What we're trying to do is give her artificial communication ability, even though she can't communicate naturally. That's right. We're giving artificial communication ability to people who can't communicate naturally through the power of AI. So as you can tell, AI is already playing a very critical role in our digital economy. And we can only expect it to get much bigger from here. Because not only can artificial intelligence complete tasks that no other human and no other algorithm can, but in fact, AI eliminates many of the mundane tasks that today's workers are faced with in order to free them to innovate and work in other areas that require them the most, such as AI. But as with all good things in life, even AI has a few of its own challenges, one of which being privacy. Now, privacy is a mostly solved problem within the field of AI itself. However, users are still very concerned about their privacy, of course, and that makes it difficult for people like me to work with AI because neural networks, which are specialized AI techniques, require a lot of data to be effective. And so, some of the brightest minds in the field of AI came together and innovated to come up with a lot of different ways to solve this problem. An example of which being differential privacy, which tries to mask user identity through artificial mathematical noise in the data. End-to-end -end encryption to make sure that the data is, remains secure. And one-time use, because artificial intelligence is special. It doesn't need its training data anymore once it's been trained. So you may discard your user data once you're done using it to train your AI systems. But then this brings me to the second challenge that I'd like to share with you, which I know is actually the main concern for AI in general. And that is, of course, the misuse of AI. However, I'd like everyone here to know that AI is completely incapable of this type of activity. Why do I say this? Well, while humans may set the objective function or the intent of AI to do something negative, this has been done with every technology that has ever existed and is being done today. We're still combating against it. And we are not stopping technological pro progress. Instead, what we're doing is we're accelerating it. So why would we stop here just because of AI? 
But AI itself cannot change its own intent. It cannot change what it was programmed to do. Because its objective function, the objective for it, is completely constant. Which is why it is completely safe for governments, economies, and companies to completely integrate with. And to conclude, I'd like to share this with you. I started my journey into the world of coding and programming computers when I was at a very young age, at five years old. From there, I used books and the internet as learning resources, and at the same time, created a YouTube channel and authored blogs and books so I could share what I learned with the rest of the world. At this point, I realized there is a huge knowledge gap in the world. So what I did is I made a resolve to reach out to at least 100,000 aspiring beginners to help them learn and innovate along their journey of programming. And I'm very glad to say that I've already reached around 5,000 people. However, I don't want to stop at 100,000. And I realize that it's impossible to make the bigger change alone. Because the digital economy requires systemic change and the support of all stakeholders involved. Which is why I also believe with Mark Anderson's vision, which is that in the future, there will only be two types of jobs. Those in which people tell computers what to do, and those in which people are told what to do by computers. And so out of everything that I've said today, I believe there are two things that governments need to do to sustain the growth of the digital economy. Number one, governments need to support the programs that foster digital skills development in the youth. And they need to do this so that they are future-proofed for the era in which AI is the dominant part of the digital economy. And so that we can nurture the computational thinking in our youth. And number two, governments need to invest really heavily in the research and development that we're doing for AI now, so that we can build a foundation and the base for the future of the digital economy and start leveraging it and using it to our advantage very, very soon. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. And we, the youth, count on your support. Thank you very much, Tanmai Bakshi, a developer and AI activist, 13 years old, the youngest person in the room, at least mathematically. Um, now we move on to uh, the interactive part of our session today. Uh, we'll be hearing interventions by ministers, deputy ministers, and they will be followed by C-level executives. Um, remember, just a quick reminder, we're looking for as diverse a collection of views as possible. So please, please, please try to keep your intervention to three minutes tops. Um, again, in case I have to interrupt you, it's just my job. Um, I have to try and make this uh, part of the conversation as profitable as possible. Uh, again, please, please wave your placard so we can see you, some members of the ITU staff, or myself, uh, we can see you and we can continue adding, adding you guys uh, to the list. Um, remember that we have three guiding questions today. Uh, we're going to have, our discussion is going to be just orientated by, one, what are the emerging technologies which have the potential to drive digital transformation while fostering sustainable growth of the digital economy? How can the digital economy turn today's challenges into tomorrow's opportunities? And number three, 25 years from now, will we be able to maintain the human face of ICTs and how? Um, we already have a number of requests uh, for speaking. Um, our first representative in the list is now representative from Azerbaijan, Minister Representative 
uh, please, the floor is yours. Distinguished Chairman, His Excellency Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, I want to join to these very interesting and fruitful discussions on topics sustainable development goals and digital economy and to contribute to this discussion. Especially last speaker, the long, uh, young researcher, has mentioned about artificial intelligence, which is very important for the, not only the digital economy, for our future life. I won't mention it. More, uh, I think more than a little bit more 30 years ago, when I was a student in the university, I worked on this research. I had some research on artificial intelligence. And during these 30 years, I think for each result, when we spoke about the power of artificial intelligence, who can assist for the, some uh, our purposes which oriented on sustainable development goals. But before that, our meetings is dedicated to the 25th anniversary of ITUD. ITUD. Taking this opportunity, I can congratulate all of us such tremendous event. Now I want to attract your attention to our activities on achieving sustainable development goals. As uh, a dynamically developing country, Azerbaijan has set key priority for future development, such as diversification economy, increasing the potential of ICT sector, and enhancing the export-oriented industry. Currently, the digital economy is considered as an integral part of national economic policy, and Azerbaijan has made big progress on, in this direction. Creation of the digital economy has been set forward as one of main goals according to the National Strategy for Development of Information Society, which adopted in 2014. At the end of 2016, the government of Azerbaijan has adopted 12 strategic roadmaps for key sectors of national economy, including strategic roadmap on the development of telecommunication and information technologies. Uh, technologies. All these roadmaps fully correlated to SDGs and include many tasks for realization SDGs. The development ICT and innovative development are priorities of Azerbaijan state policy. Azerbaijan achieved remarkable results on implementation of ICT. Today, around 80% of population are broadband users. These services are widely used for providing public services to citizens and businesses. The signature are actively used for these purposes. ICT, mobile apps, and e-services are vital components of daily activity, government, business, and citizens. In our activity, we follow global development trends and cooperate with many countries and give high attention to European best practice. Well, recently, I am and the minister from Slovenia together we participate in two uh, second ministerial meeting on digital economy where we discuss tasks for global development of our countries by implementation of ICT. I would like to take this opportunity to greet Mr. Ansip, Vice President of the European Commission, who chaired this meeting. We are confident about ICT's essential role in achievement of SDGs. We believe that the action aimed at realization of SDGs will ensure overall development of our countries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister Representative of Azerbaijan. Uh, I would like to move on to uh, Minister Representative from Poland. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Karol Okoński. I'm a Deputy Minister of Digitalization. Uh, and referring to the first question that was posted here for our discussion, I would like to say that there is actually one common element for all the high-tech uh, technologies, all the innovations, uh, and all, all has come up to, to the data. So, I mean, all the, all the new innovations, all the new technologies like uh, Internet of Things, like artificial 
intelligence that was mentioned here so vividly a few minutes ago, uh, they, all, they all just refer to data, are data driven. And um, what, what I would like to stress is the fact that uh, today all companies, regardless of the size, uh, depend on data flows. Uh, and the data transfer between countries, uh, this is something essential for, for trade and production. Uh, before the global nature of, uh, of current uh, economy is the fact that uh, they are just the supply chains span across across uh, geography geographies and the importance of data transmission will, of course will grow in, grow even further with the widespread use of the technologies uh, like AI IOT and and all others uh, because it will be just a necessity and the data flows are expected to become so important that we as Poland uh, are calling uh, for the free movement of data as being the, the, fifth, the fifth freedom, the fifth human freedom alongside the free movement of goods, free movement of services, capital and people. And uh, Poland has succeeded so far in uh, making the free movement of data a high political priority in European Union. Uh, so uh, we are really happy that we are attracting here uh, more, more, more and more support from both the European Union Commission and European Union countries and would like to initiate also the discussion about this at global level because we think that uh, as one, it, the, the free flow of data would be actually one of the fundamentals of the uh, long-term development of the, of, the, of the emerging technologies. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to invite our panel uh, to share with us some thoughts on the two representatives who just uh, spoke to us. Do we have uh, some thoughts on the free flow of data? Do, do you want to take the, yeah, the floor is yours. I, I agree with the Polish uh, speaker. Um, Trends, not in the European Union, but globally, is, is quite bad. Number of uh, laws pushing on forceful data localization is increasing. Just in the European Union, we already have 56 uh, different rules uh, uh, in 21 member states uh, uh, dealing with forceful data localizations. And as we all know, if uh, you have to gather those data just uh, from some small uh, territories. Then uh, uh, most likely somebody else uh, who will be able to collect data uh, from bigger markets, uh, uh, 300 million healthy customers or 1 billion uh, customers uh, will be able to reach those uh, new and higher levels of efficiency uh, much sooner than uh, uh, those uh, 28 uh, relatively small uh, countries. So in the European Union, we launched uh, a proposal according with um, uh, this principle uh, allowing free data flows across borders, across uh, uh, the European Union will be set as a rule. And it means uh, forceful data localizations uh, will be prohibited. But uh, we have to uh, deal with those issues also uh, when uh, uh, talking about ITU, for example. I'm happy that uh, a year ago, uh, when we had the G7 uh, ICT ministerial meeting in uh, Takamatsu, then in this uh, uh, final uh, declaration, we stated it very, it very clearly, uh, Free data flows, it has to be as a rule, uh, also when talking about G7 uh, countries. Now, when in uh, uh, Argentina, uh, we have to remember that uh, Argentina will take very soon over uh, this uh, G20 presidency. And once again, uh, in Dusseldorf, uh, G20 countries agreed uh, uh, with a principle to allow uh, free data flows uh, uh, also when talking about G20 uh, countries. So it's easy to say we have to set the, this as a principle to allow free data flows, but at the same time there will be some people who will say that no, no, uh, 
uh, we have to keep data inside of our beautiful countries, uh, uh, then uh, our people, they will get the jobs, uh, we will uh, we have to process uh, those data inside of the, uh, our countries and not uh, to move those data out of our countries. So I, I would like to say that uh, the, those free data flows, those are exactly about jobs and uh, about uh, salaries of our people. If we will set restrictions on free data flows, then uh, most likely uh, those who are producing some kind of uh, equipment, uh, uh, they will be not able to compete uh, uh, anymore uh, globally. And it means uh, uh, th those people will lose their jobs. So uh, to be more concrete, we don't have time, but uh, um, Rolls-Royce, uh, airplanes, uh, they collected uh, practically all those engines uh, and uh, they're getting information directly from uh, engines uh, about, and uh, on basis of uh, this information, they are able to provide uh, an advice about maintenance, uh, but also uh, about altitude, speeds, and, and so on. We can say it's uh, connected with free data flows and it's a really green solution. It helps to save energy, uh, it's it's good solution. Car wash machines produced in one country, in Spain for example, I know, uh, they did it uh, first, they started to produce automatic uh, car wash machines, but uh, very soon all the other countries, uh, they started also to produce uh, car wash machines. And then those Spanish producers, uh, they put sensors uh, into those car wash machines and uh, they're getting uh, directly information from those through those sensors uh, uh, and in this way they don't have to state just uh, that you have to change some parts after every 500 hours wor working hours but uh, uh, they, they, they can say that uh, this part we have to change after 700 uh, working hours but in some other cases maybe 490 so they then don't have to stop those uh, car wash machines anymore uh, just to wait for some kind of spare parts just in time. Service guy will uh, uh, provide uh, uh, those parts and then and, will and fix uh, the problems. It means, once again, when talking about uh, free data flows, we have to talk about our competitiveness, we have to talk about our jobs, and our salaries of our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ansip. Uh, please, please go on, take it. Oh, this one? Oh, great. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, I, I got something to add here, uh, which is that I believe uh, that's actually an amazing idea uh, as, a, as a fifth uh, human freedom uh, to have data flowing freely. And the reason I believe so uh, is because if you think about it, our naive AI techniques uh, are really algorithm driven. Uh, however, nowadays we've got things like neural networks, which are not just algorithm driven. Of course, they're model driven, but you can have an amazing model, but without data, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, they're extremely data driven. Uh, like, for example, if we're training a self-driving car, Tesla Autopilot, uh, you're not going to start developing an entire algorithm that checks everything, you know, every single possible condition on the road uh, to try and see, okay, does this condition match? If so, do this. Uh, you're going to go for a data-driven approach, meaning uh, that you are going to, you know, take hours and hours of human driving, feed it into a neural network and see what it thinks, uh, see if it's able to start driving. Uh, and so I think that's an amazing idea because, I mean, at this point, uh, we are so, uh, so hungry for data. In fact, it's becoming practically a natural resource at this point, uh, to the point that, for example, startups are actually paying uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers to actually put sensors in their cars uh, and collect data for them. Uh, and so, again, we are really, really hungry for data to be able to train these AI systems, and once we're able to get that data, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of actually finding out what types of models works better, work better than others. It's just a model, matter of the actual algorithms uh, before we're able to see some really, really impactful stuff, uh, especially in fields like healthcare, uh, where we can really save lots of humans' lives uh, just by, you know, for example, allowing this data to flow freely. We're able to take older data relating to cancer treatment, cancer diagnosis, uh, and train AI that can, again, save so many people's lives. Thank you very much. It's the turn of Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Gopal Ivnikar, please. 
Thank you. Just shortly to add to, to, add to the discussion, but uh, Commissioner Ansip also was talking about free flow. So we have uh, a lot of data, we have fast communications and internet, uh, we have a lot of possibilities what to do with the data, but do we log the data at, at home? This is extremely important and uh, I would offer the analogy that, that use it uh, often. It's like uh, if we would have, uh, I don't know, million dollars in cash and you put it under the bed. You, it's logical that you bring it to the bank because it's the safest there. But how we act in the field of data with the data localization, it's, it's like keeping the money under the bed because we want to keep our data in our servers and not to share it in, in the uh, secure way. But we have, as it was said, we have algorithms. We have all the necessities but maybe we are lacking trust. Because you bring the money to the bank which you trust. So this is why we have to cooperate, to share the services, to understand what we, how we transfer the data, how we use it and reuse it, that we start to trust each other because technology is there and it's techno technologically logical and possible. So I strongly believe that's the question of trust and this is necessary to share the data, especially when it comes to the sharing secure data or personal data that have to be specially protected. Thank you. We're currently running out of time. We are, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ansip, uh, Mr. Ansip's intervention echoed uh, the data collected by MH370 engines, uh, the airplane that was lost and recovered extensively as journalists. And the importance of the stuff we're, we're talking about now as data, the economist qualified a few weeks ago as the oil of the 21st century. In this context, I address our translators. We are running a little bit late. We're talking about really, really, really important things. Uh, we're sharing very important ideas, and I would like to make sure and confirm that you'd be okay staying with us for a few more minutes, helping us uh, with the translation as we run a little late. Can I see a raise of hands at the back? Yeah. Can we have you? Yeah, call the hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Much appreciated your effort in these uh, very important deliberations. I will have to move on and I will have to invite uh, the minister representative of Thailand uh, to address us. Sir, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I think the, I am not trying to answer your question, maybe I try to add more questions on the display instead. Uh, I am, actually as I presented from yesterday, that Thai government tried to focus on how we can connect the people who are not connected to the internet broadband. That's why uh, Thai government decided to roll out uh, fiber optic to every village, as I, I mentioned yesterday. But the question is that uh, fiber optics broadband is just the, be, the first step to connect them. But the big, um, big question for them is what kind of activity that uh, the people in the village uh, can use or can do with the fiber optic, with the broadband. That's, uh, so our government uh, think that uh, maybe two uh, activity the, the most important for the villager is the first one, try to show them this can help them to increase their income. This is the e-commerce. This is the e-commerce. But many people, the guru of e-commerce, uh, try to awareness me that uh, the first step of e-commerce is buying, not selling. <laughs> so the, the government try to Think about how we can help the villager to sell their product to another, uh, I think, not neighboring village, but to another big city, for example. A second activity is, is very crucial for everyone is the healthcare. But the healthcare, we think about an appropriate one, like the big screen, high definition, the teleconsulting, not, not the very complicated thing. This is the, the Question is, uh, I think this is the way to transform the village to digital uh, 
uh, economy. The question is uh, how we can define the, of, uh, a best practice to transform the, we call the bottom of pyramid, the people in the, in the village, uh, to help uh, to gain the momentum of digital transformation. When we try to uh, survey the literature, we can find many uh, literature uh, uh, tell about the digital transformation in the big company, the big organization, but uh, it's quite few about the, uh, how we can transform the, uh, the bottom of pyramid, as I mentioned. The second one may be, uh, uh, as the uh, General Secretary mentioned, uh, in the 25 uh, first period, we have a good infrastructure of the telecommunication. Within the, this infrastructure, we have a program we call USO, Universal Service Obligation. I personally, I try to discuss with Thai regulator and try to ask them uh, what kind of the next generation of service, uh, uh, universal service obligation for, for to support the digital transformation. That, that's the, that's I would like to, to learn from the uh, panelists or the other about it, how we can transform the village to the, to the next step. Thank you very much, Minister Representative. We jump on to uh, South Africa, Minister, Minister Representative, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, as South Africans, the first thing that we decided to do, realizing that we need to make sure that our people participate effectively in the fourth industrial revolution, was to first identify a niche for them. And the first thing that we did was to say, we've got to build a cadership that will be able to drive the digital revolution. And the first step was to make sure that we establish an institution that will help empower them with digital literal skills. And then we made sure that we partner with the universities. We identified what was missing out in the market to say, yes, we're going for the fourth industrial revolution, but what is it that our people can identify? Most countries that are advanced, they've already come up with solutions, but we need to make sure that South Africans are not left behind. The first thing was to say, let's get them connected. And therefore, after that, after they are connected, let them express themselves, let them share their stories of the villages that they come from with the entire South Africa. And by doing that, they were able to derive an economic spin-off because we have exposed them not just to technology, but connectivity and making them to be part of the global world. The second thing that we, ha we did was to say, we can't do it alone as government. We need everybody to come on board. Hence, we adopted the WEF program of the Internet for All. We invited all the big players, actually both big and, and, and small players, in the ICT field. We said, let's come, join hands, let's work together. You have to make profits, and ourselves as government, we've got to get votes. And the only way to do that is to expose my people as the policymaker to the products that you have as, 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 as a company that is operating there looking at profits. And indeed, we have seen lots of great improvement because everybody started deploying at least a maximum number of resources, therefore exposing our people, not just for them to consume, but to say what role can we play. If I were to make an example with the province where I come from, well, popularly known as the province of Nelson Mandela, the Eastern Cape, it's a very rural province, which is very big on agriculture. And the first thing that we did was to ask the communities, what are the challenges that you're experiencing here? The first thing they told us was the fact that they experienced stock theft. And we asked the young people to come up with a solution. Let's make sure that we utilize technologies to make sure that you address the challenges that they're facing. And they come up with very great innovations, including the apps that help to track the cattle that went missing, including being able to come up with drones that must assist the farmers in tracking what are the problems that their seedlings are experiencing. And indeed, we've seen great improvement in this government. We had to make sure that then, let's take them to the upper level of ensuring that they participate at the e-commerce level. We are working with the South African Post Office, and we had to say, let's digitize the Post Office. Let's make sure that our people bring whatever skills that are there, and ours is to make sure that we promote and incentivize them. That has helped us, and we believe that working with yourselves here as part of the ITU, most of the strategies that you will employ will help move South Africa forward. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, South Africa. Thank you very much. We have very, very little time left. We go to Bangladesh for one minute, please. We're very, very tight on time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Moderator. Uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, cl cloud computing, big data will in future foster digital economy, and digital economy will ensure economic empowerment, sustainable economy, inclusive economy, and also growth in GDP. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has actually observed a massive boost in mobile financial services, but we are facing a bit a challenge there. That is, the regulator in the mobile financial service is the central bank, where the network use is of that of operators, which is regulated by the Bangladesh Telecom Regulatory Commission. So, we are asking for joint regulation, as the license that is given is by BTRC, and the uh, permission for the MFS is given by the central bank. The network is regulated by BTRC, and the transaction is regulated by the central bank. So actually, for me, it does not make any sense, but there is a challenge. We, uh, we want to have joint regulation in this. And infrastructure is also a challenge. We have laid 70,000 kilometer of optical fiber, and we have uh, locally, um, we produce optical fiber too. We have two undersea cable and four terrestrial cable connectivity. 99% population are covered, 98% geographical area are covered. We have one 60 million population, 130 million are mobile phone users. But the problem is to ensure speed of broadband connectivity and make it affordable too. And uh, I can, uh, I would agree like anything with our ITU Secretary General that, you know, Bangladesh is not a least development, developed country. It is not a developed country. So our investment is from the uh, world organizations and the uh, organizations which would provide a grant or loan is decreasing. The finance ministry, uh, as I would agree with the ITU Secretary General, thinks that as a quick fix and to uh, fill up, to get their target of financial uh, you know, uh, return, it's better to invest in ICT. But without telecommunication network, actually ICT is like a mobile phone without a network coverage. That is something to be, uh, you know, taken care of by all the finance ministries. I, and the operators, they think that it is profitable to go and serve in areas where it is densely populated. So I think in this case, we have to have amongst the operators the sentiment to serve or not always to make profit, but also the mentality, the mindset to serve. Cyber security took a bad seat because we wanted digital Bangladesh uh, to go, this concept to go ahead and to implement. So I would ask all the part, all the member countries that we should work together to secure the cyber space. And uh, lastly, I would uh, say that Mr. Tanimi Bakshi, the cloud manager of Toronto. I need your intelligence desperately, which is not artificial, but real. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Bangladesh. We have one more last speaker for today. Uh, Minister Representative from Canada, please uh, join us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, we have been following the discussion on digital economy with much interest, um, noting that today is International Day for, of, the, uh, of the Girl. Um, we would like to get the distinguished panelists' views on SDG 5 about empowering women and girls as a catalyst for the implementation of all other SDGs because Canada recognizes that supporting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is the most effective way to reduce extreme poverty, challenge inequity, and build a more peaceful, inclusive, and prosperous world. Food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very short on time, so we have to continue. And now I have to invite to the podium uh, Mr. Oscar Gonzalez, 
Uh, chair of the WTDC 17, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Buenas tardes. Sí, se escucha. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Hoy hemos escuchado excelentes exposiciones, tanto sobre la importancia de las TIC en nuestra vida diaria y en el desarrollo de nuestras comunidades. También ha sido muy interesante la, la publicación que se ha presentado. Y en, el, en la segunda parte... Eh, escuchamos algunas exposiciones sobre la economía digital. Si me permiten, quisiera agregar un par de, de ideas, esta vez a, a título eh, personal y no como presidente de la, de la conferencia. Creo que hay un, un primer punto y que incluso tiene que ver con, con la última cuestión que nos traían sobre la igualdad de género. Hay un primer punto en cuanto a la importancia de las TIC y la nueva economía que se nos presenta que tiene que ver con el acceso. Y cuando me refiero al acceso, no es solo el acceso a la infraestructura, que de por sí es un elemento fundamental para que los, los ciudadanos puedan acceder a los beneficios de las TIC. Pero también me refiero al acceso a la educación en el uso de las tecnologías. Me parece que allí hay un aspecto central para eliminar desigualdades desigualdades sociales y económicas, pero también desigualdades de género. El acceso a las redes, pero también el acceso a la educación y a la formación en cuanto al uso y el aprovechamiento de, de las tecnologías. Y la segunda reflexión que quería hacer, perdón, me detengo un poquito antes porque es algo que el Secretario General sostuvo en, en el discurso de inauguración respecto de esto del acceso de no dejar nadie atrás y todavía tenemos muchas personas, muchos eh, miles de millones de personas en el mundo que todavía no tienen acceso a infraestructura y menos aún acceso a educación digital. Y el segundo aspecto que, que yo quería comentar es simplemente eh, expresar que yo entiendo que nosotros no estamos por entrar en la economía digital, sino que ya estamos en la economía digital y que todos nuestros países, en particular los países subdesarrollados y con menos nivel de desarrollo, tenemos una oportunidad grande de apoderarnos de la tecnología, de buscar oportunidades, no sentir solamente una amenaza que muchas veces recibimos porque... Eh, nuestras economías obviamente son más endebles en todos los órdenes, pero por el contrario, aprovechar las oportunidades y los desafíos que le, la economía digital nos presenta, entendiendo a la economía digital como nuevas formas de producción y de generación de riqueza basada en el conocimiento y no tanto en materias primas o en procesos industriales. Entiendo a la economía digital como una gran oportunidad para nuestras sociedades. Finalmente, agradecer a todos los panelistas, a todos los expositores, a quienes hayan hecho preguntas. Eh, como funcionario del gobierno argentino, quiero agradecerles a todos. Muchas gracias. Mr. Oscar Gonzalez, Chair of the WTDC 17. Uh, I would like to invite now uh, to share with us his conclusions and ideas to Mr. Brahim Asanu, Director of the ITU Telecommunication Development Bureau. Sir, please take the stand. Thank you. I think that you will recognize with me that this, this is the most difficult, difficult task. To try to summarize such inspiring and rich interventions, it's quite difficult. So when in, in front of the difficult situation, you try to take the easiest part of it. I will just 
share with you my personal takeaway from this discussion. Um, we have the opportunity to listen and to hear about various experiences coming from least developed countries, emerging countries, developed countries, and, and countries in special situation. As we can see, through all those, ICT is an equalizer. Equalizer in the positive manner, because through ICT, we can change the lives of people. In the developing countries, because of develop, the developing country issues, and in developed countries because of developed country issues. At the end of the day, it's just about people. We also discuss about the issue of chicken and egg between technology and people. So I think that we should not be choosing between eggs and chicken. I would like to suggest that if you first as a chicken, let's make sure that we get an egg an egg out of a chicken. And if we first have an egg, let's make sure that it becomes a chicken. What I'm trying to say here is that it is an interactive process between technology and human development. We also heard that synchronization of platform, platforms and processes are key, or is key, for the digital economy. Because digital economy is about sharing, it's about streamlining, it's, it's about saving resources for a better life. So synchronization is a key. Um, we were all, I'm sure, I'm talking about myself, I'm sure you, you agree with me, we were, we were all shaken out of our comfort zone by Tame Bakshi. Do you agree with me? Were you shaken like me? Yes, I think we are. The young man of 13 years is telling us, you guys, you have to change the way you are being looking at the world. He's telling us, don't continue to look at the world of tomorrow with your eyes of yesterday. He's telling us also that the next level digital economy will be about artificial intelligence, and then we, the government in this room here and private sector, we need to develop digital skills. We need also to develop research and development and give that to the young people and they will tell us how to do with it for the betterment of humanity. We also learn that data, big data, data is today the raw material of a digital economy or the public good should become a public good. But at the same time, we also learn that these new technologies and the connected with, for example, free data flow is now questioning our economic system and our economic groupings. We also learn that in everything we do, we need trust. I think that this is one of the foundation of what will happen. We talk about the issue of privacy. After all, when something is private to me, I can share it with someone I trust. So then, privacy will be linked with the trust. Trust is one of the pillars of the digital economy. Uh, we can all only agree with Canada that no matter, I say no matter, what we are doing for gender equality. I would say gen women empowerment. Let's empower them. Equality is a, maybe, is a maybe more than the men. What do you stop at equality? Let us empower them. No matter what you are doing, 
we should recognize we are not yet doing enough. We should be doing more. And finally, uh, I take it from the Minister of Slovenia. We have been talking, and we'll be talking about national strategies, national e-strategy, national whatever. What he's telling us is that a national strategy is a continuous collaboration at national level and international level. These are my takeaway. I hope that you are also, also your own takeaway. Please, when you leave this conference, bring back with you maximum of three takeaway, three takeaway, and make sure that you use them to change the life of your family, of your community, or your nation. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for joining us. We have distinguished panelists here, and you can see that this is a proper setting uh, of such a panel. And finally, let me also say we launched this book today, the result of a partnership between ITUD and Academia. The book is available on the website. Please feel free to communicate to all the people who are, who are interested, who are not here. Feel free to publish this book so people can use it to make a difference. Again, not easy to summarize. I hope you, you, you will excuse me if I forget something important, but it was just not easy. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brahim Asanu, Director of ITU Telecommunication De Development Bureau. Thank you very much for your closing remar uh, remarks. Uh, before I continue, I remind you, uh, you're all invited to attend tonight's uh, dinner at the Alvear Icon Hotel. It's walking distance from here. If you need uh, transport arrangements, uh, if you have specific needs, uh, there will be a bus departing from the entrance of this hotel at 6.45. That is 40 minutes from now. At the end of the gala dinner at 10.30, there will be a return, to, uh, return shuttles to the official hotels. It is my turn to uh, express my pride, my joy, and my pleasure at being a part of today's uh, exchange, deliberations, extremely enriching. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, every single speaker today and every single panelist. Thank you very much for being a part of this very important deliberations. Uh, we should also thank very much our interpreter friends who have actually made possible that we could all talk to each other in our languages. So we should say probably thank you, gracias, sie sie, spasiva, uh, uh, shukran, and I believe I've got most languages covered there. Um, if I'm not, oh, merci, I'm so sorry. Always French, my weak point. Terribly sorry for that. Terribly sorry for that. Thank you very much. Um, we have to close this event. We'll see you later at the gala. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor, as I said. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to head to the gala. Enjoy. Have a good time. Thank you.